Hi everyone, I'm Moose, this is my new Moose stash, and if clothes make the man, then the mask makes Michael Myers. After 10 on-screen appearances, the shape is a familiar sight to horror fans, but despite its simple design, the face of the boogeyman differs drastically between movies. So today on Yellow Spandex, we're investigating the mysteries of Michael Myers' masks. And of course, we'll start with the original. John Carpenter and Deborah Hill's script for Halloween isn't very specific about Michael's mask. It only makes a couple of references to it. Once as a large full head latex rubber mask, not a monster or ghoul, but the pale neutral features of a man weirdly distorted by the rubber. And then later he wears a Halloween mask made of rubber with the grotesque features of a man. So we've got pale, neutral, grotesque, and human. Still not a lot to go on, so when Carpenter sent production designer Tommy Lee Wallace out to find some candidates, he came back with a few options. One early frontrunner was a frowning rubber clown mask based off famous sourpuss Emmett Kelly, which would have made sense thematically, and considering that John Wayne Gacy was arrested the same year Halloween came out, the combo could have kicked off the whole killer clown phenomenon nearly a decade before it. <laughs> I'll drive you crazy and I'll kill you all. Carpenter liked the look, but he didn't want to commit quite yet, so they tried out a classic Richard Nixon mask, but that is more appropriate for skydiving bank robbers than silent slashers. Do you, do you know Point Break? They also gave Mr. Spock a shot, and while the sulkin Vulcan was a little closer to the mark, as usual he was stuck as second banana to William Shatner. When Nick Castle, the actor who played Michael, first tried on that $2 Captain Kirk mask, the crew knew they had nailed it. All it needed was a few minor touch-ups. We changed a lot. We opened up the eye sockets, we changed the hair. Yanked off the sideburns and uh, spray painted the whole thing white, fish belly white. Once the shape had taken shape, Halloween was released to critical acclaim and unprecedented box office success. Okay, that's Halloween, a horror movie we both think is pretty good. Very good. Making a sequel a no-brainer. And luckily enough, they were able to use the exact same mask from the first film, since producer Deborah Hill had kept it in a box beneath her bed after production wrapped. Now, if you compare the two movies, they actually look fairly different, so some fans are skeptical that the masks are one and the same, but there are some perfectly reasonable explanations for the discrepancy. For one thing, latex ages, especially when it's kept in the home of a heavy smoker like Hill. Second, they definitely gave the hair a new coat of paint. And last but not least, Nick Castle didn't reprise his role as Mikey for part two, and new actor Dick Warlock's head was a different shape than the original shape, so the mask didn't sit on it quite the same way. It still looked fantastic though, and it would have been a fine send off for the babysitter slasher if they didn't revive him for the Thorn trilogy. Part two was supposed to be the end of Michael Myers, so when Dick Warlock asked if he could keep the costume, the producer said, sure, go ahead. Unfortunately, that meant the original mask was nowhere to be found seven years later, when they resurrected the shape to hunt down his niece, Jamie. Spoiler alert, okay, here we go. I'm Aaron, I'm fixing all my mistakes. You guys, you guys are right, I fucked up. The girl, Jamie, is Michael's niece, not his cousin. Sam Hain, even though it's pronounced Sam Hain in the movie, is pronounced Samhain. The festival of Sam Hain. Oh, no, 1998 Godzilla, not a girl. I don't want to say he's a boy, not a girl. It's 2018. Sorry, you got me. Cuff him. Instead of finding another Captain Kirk, they decided to create their own from scratch, resulting in one of the worst masks in the whole series. Apparently, they were experimenting with a much different look early on, since in one scene, Dr. Loomis is attacked by a boogeyman wearing a pink mask with big blonde hair. <laughs> but even the more familiar final version looks pretty pathetic. It's super thin and wrinkly, there's barely any detail to it, and the thick brows, tiny eye holes, and surprise facial expression makes him look more like Mac from Always Sunny than the embodiment of evil. Now granted, the differences are kind of written into the script, since his original mask was destroyed in a hospital explosion and he just snagged a new one from the drugstore, and honestly, you can't expect them to keep the same masks in stock that were used to butcher babysitters 10 years earlier. That would be in poor taste. 
Halloween 5, on the other hand, is supposed to be the exact same mask from part four, but given how awful that one looked, I'm not gonna crucify the producers for whipping up a new one, continuity be damned. It's still not as detailed as the original shape, and judging from the big ass neck, it doesn't quite fit properly, but it's definitely an improvement over its predecessor, and honestly, the shape is in the shadows for so much of this movie, you could barely see it anyway. Now, say what you will about the mess that is part six, it has one of the better masks in the series. There's no on-screen explanation as to where Michael gets it, but Homeboy must have found a stockpile of Star Trek paraphernalia somewhere because it's extremely close to the original design. Sure, the ears are a little big and the hair is a little crazy, but it's not a bad way to send off the original cannon. <laughs> Unfortunately, when the series was rebooted three years later with H2O, they ditched this design in favor of multiple masks. Halloween H2O used not one, not two, but four different masks throughout the course of filming. The original plan was to go with the same mold used for part six, but director Steve Miner had a very different vision. He wanted the mask to be a pure blank white, different than those that had come before, and devoid of William Shatner's chiseled jaw and devastating cheekbones. The K&B mask, as it was known, was met with a dismal reaction during dailies, and it was quickly replaced by a more traditional design by Walking Dead FX whiz Greg Nicotero. Then, after shooting half the movie, Miner decided he hated the new mask, and enlisted Stan Winston's studio to make yet another version that was sort of a mix between the two. It wasn't like we were hired and then fired and then John Beekler was hired and fired and then Stan Winston was hired and fired. It was more like the mask took on a life of its own. The result is a movie where Michael Myers' mask is constantly changing even in the same scene. And at some points, it even turns into the most unnecessary CGI since Wolverine's claws and origins. Even at its best, the mask still leaves a lot to be desired. My biggest beef is that the thing is just too damn tight. Michael's eyes are almost always visible, which kind of takes away from the whole soulless, faceless boogeyman mystique. Halloween Resurrection isn't much better, although at least it's consistent, but after Buster Rhymes, Karate kicked him into oblivion. Mikey went back to basics for the Rob Zombie reboots. Masks play a much bigger role in the 2007 Halloween. Mikey is obsessed with them from day one, although his sister's boyfriend is the one who picks out the classic Captain Kirk design. The mask is even closer to the original than part six, only it's cracked and yellowed and rotting after spending years under the Myers floorboards. Part two takes that to the extreme with a mask that's literally falling apart at the seams, revealing more and more of Michael's face as the movie goes on. It's definitely terrifying, but just like the H2O eyes, I feel like it kind of humanizes the shape just a bit too much. That brings us to 2018 and the new Halloween sequel slash reboot from David Gordon Green and Danny McBride. Makeup artist Christopher Nelson literally begged for the opportunity to take a crack at Michael's mask. And while he originally toyed with some very different ideas, John Carpenter encouraged the team to keep the shape simple and relentless. The resulting mask is a similar sculpt to the original, and while it might seem basic on the surface, throughout shooting, Nelson would constantly shift the padding underneath the mask and change up the spatters and paint on the surface to give the illusion that it's a living, decaying extension of Michael's own aged flesh. One touch I love about the new mask is how it bears the battle scars of the original night he came home, with a hole in the neck and stains around the eye socket where Lori stabbed him with a wire hanger. It really sells the idea that Halloween 2018 is a faithful follow-up to the first film, and it's gonna be a great foundation for all those inevitable sequels. As for the original mask, the one that kicked off the series and helped redefine the horror genre, well, believe it or not, the prop still exists. In 2017, Halloween fan site MichaelMyers.net tracked it down to Ohio haunted house owner Mark Roberts, who had purchased the prop from Dick Warlock in 2003. Today, the shape is in rough shape, but it's honestly a miracle that this 40-year-old unrestored prop hasn't just rotted away into nothingness. 
It's insured for $250,000, which ain't bad considering it started life as a $2 Captain Kirk mask. It just goes to show you that you don't need expensive makeup and gallons of gore to create an effective on-screen slasher. With just a little ingenuity and oodles of atmosphere, a simple, neutral, blank mask became horror's most iconic face. You can't kill the boogeyman. <laughs> Thanks for watching everyone. Well, the new Halloween is out. It made a ton of money and everyone really, really likes it. I liked it okay, but I really hated the ending. Leave a comment, let me know what you thought and maybe I'll debate you and tell you why it got me so worked up. In the meantime, please subscribe to Now This Nerd and have a happy Halloween.